Hey guys, so today I'm back doing another collab with my girl Mexi. Um, if you don't know Mexi, I've done a couple of collabs with her in the past and she's awesome. She's got a leftist channel here on YouTube um, and she's one of my favorites. So um, when you're done watching my video, make sure you go check hers out. Um, today we're going to be discussing the absolute horrors of the IMF, um, the Inst International Monetary Fund, uh, and the World Bank, um, which like I, I can't. I honestly can't say enough horrible things about these corrupt institutions. Uh, they've like done so much damage under the guise of decreasing poverty and stabilizing the international economy when really like all they've done is managed to create this global neoliberal hegemony that serves Western imperial nations, mainly the United States, but also Canada, Great Britain, France, and they're basically responsible for the continual perpetu perpetuation of the so-called third world, I hate that word, but um, you know, third world conditions, um, using debt as their weapon. So let's talk about it. Beginning after World War II, as one country after another gained independence from European imperialism, direct military domination began to be replaced with economic domination. Former colonies were charged billions of dollars for their so-called independence, um, as this was apparently their share of the total debts of the former imperialist empires. Um, this obviously kept them highly dependent on their former colonial masters, which was the plan, of course. Turns out you don't need to use direct violence to colonize a nation anymore. Uh, debt served the exact same purpose. Established as part of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, the IMF and the World Bank are basically sister intergovernmental organizations um, charged with maintaining the economic order of the world. The IMF is tasked with stabilizing exchange rates and providing short-term loans to developing countries. The World Bank is responsible for reducing poverty by providing long-term loans for developmental projects. Both institutions are sort of seen as lenders of last resort and both work in tandem with each other. Many of their policy policies are like inextricably linked, so it's sometimes very hard to untangle the two. I think it's also super important to talk about the relationship between the United States and these two institutions, as the US has significant influence over what policies are put into place and how the bank fund conducts its business. This is because the United States has 17% of the voting power in the IMF and 16% in uh, voting power in the World Bank, making it the only country able to veto any decision that it disagrees with or that goes against its own interests and no one can challenge them. Because voting power here is not measured by population or something fair like that, but by how much money a country contributes to them and the United States is their largest backer. Also, at this point, the United States has so much clout politically, like the IMF and World Bank are basically in their pockets. Other influential countries uh, include France, Germany, Japan, Great Britain, and the rest of the countries that make up the G7, who make up 46% of the combined vote. Having said that, I just want to put it out there too that the the bank and the fund are public institutions, technically paid for by the taxes of working people from these donor countries. However, the bank fund doesn't report to any of them or the people that they're supposedly tasked with helping. Instead, they report directly to the ministries of finance and governments of these powerful institutions. So in the 1960s and 70s, many of the recently free uh, ex-colonial developing countries took out loans with the World Bank and the IMF in order to build up their economies and improve living conditions for their people. It's also, I think, worth mentioning that many of these countries were run by corrupt and tyrannical dictators that often siphoned off these funds for personal gains. And the IMF and the World Bank knowingly did business with these shady characters and knowingly misappropriated funds. These dictators often then like retired to some like lavish destination, leaving their poor population stuck to pay this debt. 
I'll talk more about that later though. So anyways, these countries, they take on more and more debt until the 1980s when the Latin American debt crisis hits, leaving many countries, not just in Latin America, but across the globe, um, unable to pay back their loans which threatened to completely destabilize the international credit system. And this crisis provided the perfect setup for Western powers to push their free trade agenda on the developing world, albeit very discreetly. Because developed nations could no longer just like go in and directly invade a country on a whim without cause, without major backlash, backlash from the masses, um, a cover story of sorts like needed to be implemented. Enter the IMF and the World Bank, who present as these philanthropic saviors, uh, promising to, again, stabilize struggling nation's uh, economies and offer democracy to all. But what's really going on is this. The IMF, the World Bank, the Bank Fund prey on desperate, struggling nations by providing financial assistance to them, but they attach extremely high interest rates and force them to incorporate these neoliberal programs and policies to their economic structure, something commonly referred to as structural adjustment programs. So this may include trade liberalization, which is just basically removing any obstacles um, to trade, including like tariffs, quotas, licensing, rules. Um, these stipulations might include privatization, deregulation of domestic industries, devaluing their currency. All of these policies put into place in an attempt to make the markets more suitable for exploitation by multinational corporations and foreign investors. And ultimately, it just serves to keep the global south dependent on western superpowers. So one of the conditions often imposed on these poor countries is that they become export-oriented open markets that stick to selling just a few natural resources or cash crops, such as coffee or nuts or cotton. But because every country is basically given the same prescription, regardless of its individual circumstances, what ends up happening is a large-scale price war pretty much ensues. So therefore, you know, each country is trying to underbid the other and inevitably prices drop. And who do you think this benefits? You guessed it, a Western nations benefit as they're typically the ones that purchase these resources. And well, because prices have dropped, these poorer countries need to increase their exports, hoping to keep their currency stable and earn enough money to uh, keep paying on their debt. This often leads to cuts in government spending, decreased consumption, unemployment, cuts in wages, um, eventually leading to social unrest and upheaval. Um, and when things get messy, it's super easy for investors to pull their capital out of these countries, um, often leading to economic crisis and sometimes collapse. This is exactly what happened in Senegal. When Senegal, a country in West Africa, gained its independence in 1960, the groundnut was their number one primary export crop. By specializing in the thing that a country does best and then trading for the other things it needs, it maximizes its productivity. Now, because Senegal had just recently gained its freedom, it lacked the resources necessary to invest in its own development. So here enters the World Bank. There's a lot that you need if you want to succeed as a viable industrial nation. You need power plants and roads, bridges, telephones, dams, drains, and irrigation. If you need a little cash, we'll help you in a flash. The World Bank will come to your aid. We'll loan you some dough so that you can grow and compete in international trade. The World Bank gives them a loan and, of course, you know, pushes them to continue exporting nuts. However, during the 1980s, numerous other developing countries enter the market selling the same nuts, thus decreasing the price of ground nuts. It's the law of supply and demand. When supply goes up without a corresponding increase in demand, the price will go down. This means Senegal was getting less money for their exports than before, which forced them into another loan with the World Bank, um, and this time structural adjustment comes into play. Facing bankruptcy, Senegal implemented an economic reform program with the aid of World Bank economists. This program followed the economic thinking of the time and called for 
which begins with the removal of tariffs and duties. So taxes on imports of foreign nuts were removed. Then privatisation. Reducing government involvement in industry. The state-run ground nut company Sonicos, which had guaranteed prices to the farmers, was partially privatised. And cuts in public spending. They implemented the new strategy for ten years, but the situation only got worse. As the price of nuts went down, the debt got out of control. Senegal fell so far into debt that they were paying more to pay back their loans than they were on health and education combined. It's funny because we constantly hear this revisionist history pushed by Western imperial nations of how they garnered their wealth and prosperity fair and square through free trade and free market policies and um, you know, we're still, we're always seeing this constant push for less, uh, less restrictions on trade, more open market system, um, when they themselves have never actually participated in such a system. Instead, they rely on what is essentially a mercantilist economic system that has served to create and perpetuate a very unequal balance of power in a system of trade that is rigged in their favor. It's like, it's like th these developing countries are required through the policies of the bank fund to eliminate subsidies, slash their tariffs, basically do everything they can to make life easier for Western investors and corporations. Um, but do Western countries need to follow any of these rules? Absolutely not. They've benefited tremendously from these practices while they themselves continue to subsidize their products, undercutting uh, local producers in poor countries, therefore increasing their market share and making tons of money in the process. They are absolutely interested in protectionism for their own interest while forcing open markets on poor nations. All these policies severely undermine a developing country's sovereignty um, and ability to make their own decisions. So democratically elected government officials of poor countries are no longer accountable to their own constituents, to their own people, but to their Western lenders who demand austerity and privatization and deregulation. Just all these things that make them further dependent on the West. And the effects on these poor countries is absolute devastation. Most of these developing countries end up spending more money on debt repayment than on health and education and actually developing and fixing their economy and um, spend more money paying off the interest on their debts than they do on the actual debt itself. Homes are destroyed, people are displaced. An investigative report conducted by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and the Huffington Post found that between 2004 and 2014, the World Bank funded development projects uh, across the Global South, resulting in the mass displacement and the forced removal of something like 3.4 million indigenous people from their homes. In Ethiopia, for example, a group of indigenous Christian farmers known as the Anuak were forcibly removed from their homes by Ethiopian soldiers, forced to flee to refugee camps in South Sudan, all to make room for development projects funded by the World Bank. Many of the women were raped, people were tortured and killed. <laughs> Turns out the Anuak were living on very valuable farmlands, which were subsequently sold to wealthy investors. Surprise, surprise. This, along with plenty of other forced resettlement programs, all funded by the World Bank. The World Bank has an obligation to check where its money is going, and the World Bank has an obligation to resettle people who are displaced from their homes or their livelihoods in equal or better conditions. What our investigation found is that on a systemic level, 
they're failing to meet those obligations. So it turns out this isn't just one case. The World Bank has financed numerous governments and corporations accused of human rights violations, including rape and murder. From 2009 to 2013, the World Bank invested $50 billion to projects that were rated as having the highest risk for irreversible or unprecedented social or environmental impacts. I didn't even get a chance to talk about the environmental impacts. That's a whole other video. Um, but so basically the World Bank just um, continues to fund corrupt and dangerous regimes and businesses in order to profit already wealthy uh, U.S. and multinational corporations. It's freaking disgusting. In Confessions of an Economic Hitman, uh, John Perkins describes the process of how these Western, wealthy Western uh, corporations, together with the IMF and the World Bank, uh, target, exploit, and bankrupt these developing nations, um, and how they end up walking away richer, um, able to like openly access an abundance of natural resources, cheap labor, cheap markets. So here's here's the clip. And we work many different ways. But perhaps the most common is we will identify a a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. and such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. It's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work that you put a country in debt and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest. And you demand this quid pro quo, which you call a conditionality or good governance, which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. So basically we have these ex-colonies, you know, these developing countries that apparently escaped imperial domination years ago. But, I mean, did they really? It, it seems to me they've never actually been free or independent. They've basically been living in perpetual debt and poverty, slaves to the Western world, um, since their supposed independence. Imperialism never ended. It simply changed shape. Um, and the IMF and the World Bank have been absolutely instrumental in, de in developing this new form of colonialism. So... I'm gonna end with that. I'm gonna leave a bunch of leaks. Uh, bleh, I'm gonna leave a bunch of links down below for you guys to check out. There's literally um, just like a litany of complaints. So many countries, one after another, like completely devastated. And the crazy thing to me is that these institutions managed to go largely under the radar. They, <sighs> So, okay, so that's it. Um, I highly suggest obviously heading over to Mexi's video and channel. Um, like I said, she's going to be focusing more specifically on um, the structural adjustment programs. Um, so yeah, uh, make sure you check her out. Uh, leave a like if you like this video. Uh, comment. I'd love to hear your comments. Subscribe if you want. And thanks so much for watching.